Good evening, TEDx. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> I want to talk about something that is a new topic for me, but it's one I've been thinking about for a long time. My profession is walking. I teach cities how to build places where people can walk and walk better. And I have had the chance to work in every size, every scale community. Now this is ordinary to me. What is not ordinary is about what I am now going to show you. We have not been thinking well enough about how to address aging and walking. Aging is the most important thing that we can hold on to, uh, considering the alternative. But if we're going to age well, we have to have an environment that works. And the environment you see here is what we built. It's a habitat that is not fit for humanity. And so as I review my own life and think about the fact, OK, now I'm 68 years old. And what will the rest of my life be? I'm thinking about how our elders are able to walk in a car-oriented society. So there was a period that I drove a car a lot. I have now given up driving cars as something I own. I still do it for my work. And uh, I'm going to share with you why I think it's important that we change our idea about what is walkable. Think about the very first thing that cognitively a child wants to mimic that they see the older folks doing. It's walking. Walking is the last thing any human being wants to give up. It is not driving a car. And I'll point out why that is true. Walking is the way to human health. There has never been a better prescription. It is cheap. It's e easily accessible to anyone who selects a good place in which to live. Now, I want to focus in on my mom. She died last December at the age of 93. Now that's great news for me to have had my mom all these years, but it's also bad news. It means I am going to outlive my ability to drive a car for 12 to 17 years. What will I do when I can no longer drive a car? Right now, that's a choice I make. So I need to think about the fact that my genes, my father, uh, my wife's parents, all of us are predisposed to live longer than average. The sad statistic is all of us in this room, on average, are going to live seven to 10 years beyond when we can physically drive a car. So where do we live, and how can we improve upon this to have the best end game that we could have on the planet? My mom was very fortunate. She could still live in her neighborhood, in her house, all the way up through 93. And this is the statistic we now need to focus on. The boom years. I'm a boomer. I'm actually a pre-boomer. Uh, but the boomers are going to be a huge chunk of our population. And what if they live so long that they can no longer uh, use the mobility of the personal car? Now, based on my age and who I am, I'm now middle old. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to getting all the way to very old, because I don't like the alternative. But I can still drive a car easily. I can walk. I can bike. I can do everything that virtually anyone in this room can do, because I have the energy to do it. But these are the things that affect an older driver. We don't see as much. Uh, our peripheral vision shrinks. Our eye doesn't focus quickly anymore. Uh, in fact, the older we get, the slower we go from near to our focus. Uh, we no longer see contrast anywhere near as well as we need to see, and we slow down. The woman standing safely on a median will not step fully into the street until the younger people are out of the street on the other side, and that's just fact. Uh, so we need to think about all these things and then think about what would it be like if we don't have our personal mobility any longer. We're going to see more and more prescriptions earlier and earlier times that people end up in an ultra care facility until and unless we can address urban design so that people don't have to walk through this kind of an environment. 
We need to think about why we built this and now how we can build something much better. So I'm going to use this woman as an example. I'm figuring she's in her middle 90s. She lives in a town that is immensely walkable. It's cold, but she can take care of herself. I photographed her here. Two hours later, she comes walking past me at the far end of her downtown. This is maintaining her health. So, planning ahead, six years ago, I bought what I consider my last home in Port Townsend, Washington. And this is why. This is the naturally occurring scene everywhere. We have one of the largest, perhaps the largest farmer's market for a town of our size, around 8,000 people. We have three grocery stores I can walk to within 15 minutes and get health along the way, and they sell nothing but healthy foods. We already have 25 uh, organic uh, gardens, and we're going to have over 250. My wife is a volunteer. She helps start the gardens. So we need to think about how do we design and rescue suburban places so that we have the kind of infill where people don't have to sell their homes, they can live in place. And if they're going to have an active and a, a, a quality of life, they have to have places to go to. A place like a park where they can sit. A place on a street where they can share with neighbors and friends. A way to go shopping and maintain that freedom. Now to do this, if you look at the upper left photo, we have to convert some, not all, but some of our strips into true villages. And we need to place these villages where we can capture the greatest number of homes. We do the same with our streets. We do the same uh, when we have downtowns. So from the urban sprawl repair manual, uh, or I'm sorry, the suburban <laughs> sprawl repair manual, uh, this looks like a lot of Phoenix. Am I right about that, folks? Uh, can this be rescued? And if it can't, we are in trouble. But the good news is uh, this format of discussing how we can build something that works, we can get there. And we can have complete places where people can shop, they can feel the right levels of enclosure. We take a street like this as an example. And when we complete the act, using the same exact right of way, we can have a place where people can live, they can walk, they can get across the street, they can enjoy bumping into other people. One of the first streets that got converted in, in my uh, post-Florida DOT career was this one in University uh, Place, Washington. Uh, this uh, not only ended a lot of the traffic congestion, but it made it easy for people to get across the street. It's a roundabout. And roundabouts, uh, we now have over 150 in Washington alone. Uh, they make it very easy to get across the street. They control the speed of traffic. Elsewhere in University Place, I think you can see we built uh, a long time ago a bad road that takes a lot of human lives. And within a year, they had uh, managed to change it to this. I'll show you the transition from uh, just completing the project to nine years later. This has now attracted lots of shops and all kinds of great places. We put in the first raised crossing on a major uh, US highway on this road so people can get to their library, they can get to their service centers. A truly walkable community and honoring the older folks has just lots of destinations and has housing that is, is especially dense near these village centers. So let's go back. This is the first development in America. It's in Beacon Hill, uh, all lots of open air and within 1,550 feet of all the most important things we can dream of, <laughs> including the Cheers Bar. Uh, but meanwhile, this is what we ended up building. Uh, this is somewhere else, of course, Orlando. It's 1,550 <laughs> feet from nothing. And uh, so we need to think about that. We've got homes. You can get into them. You've even got a sidewalk, but there is nowhere to go. Think about that. For seven to ten years, nowhere to go. Now, we need new housing stock, and we need a lot of it. And this is the housing stock we're likely to build, uh, apartments, townhouses, that kind of thing. But we better not build it this way. Instead, using the same exact number of units, uh, we can build a court, something beautiful, 
a place where we can step out on a patio and be with children or other folks, have our own private place. Another example, uh, this one has, I think, over 60 units at very affordable prices, is in the very heart of Sacramento's historic district. It was an act of care and love by people who understand how to build. This project, uh, which is one of my favorites, and, and fairly early on, Fairview Village in the Portland area, I think you can see, has a real mix of housing types. It has open space, creeks, all kinds of cool things. It even has a target. And uh, it's on the edge, it's not in the middle. So you see housing that people can easily access, get in and out of their homes, uh, be in charge of watching over the entire neighborhood. And in the same village area, uh, uh, you know, average home for single family residential, it happens to have an accessory dwelling unit, but in the same neighborhood, a fourplex that looks like a single plex. And then we see apartments right across the street. So someone could live in the single family residential and eventually move but stay in the neighborhood and now have a little higher level care, but the grandchildren can still visit. This is what we're talking about. I want to close by talking about one of my best friends. Uh, Dan Butner and I call ourselves brothers of different mothers. Uh, we've done a lot of the same things in life. He biked from Alaska to Argentina. I uh, biked early on and inspired him, I found later. But Dan picked a project, Albert Lee, Minnesota, in order to find out if we could extend the life of people and the quality of life. By studying what he called blue zones, the places in the world where people are living longer than others, he was able to come up with the principles. We inserted these principles in Albert Lee. Three years later, we proved we cut the healthcare costs in half. And we extended the average life of everyone in that community two and a half years. We can do it by building a great built environment. But that built environment needs to be an active environment where people walk, they meet their neighbors, uh, they have many places to go, and they have many friends and many people to watch over them. One of the great gifts to my mom is she had this incredible circle of friends that would just come by every day because she networked. And uh, with all of that, uh, I want to say the final end game for me, and I'll show it to you, is this. Uh, let's go back. I think we have to, <laughs> come on, let's get to the final, final, final image. Uh, to be able to go places and do things based on the fact that we built the urban environment that is a habitat for human beings and that works. So with that, thank you very much. Go out and build a great Phoenix and one that's gonna work for everyone of all years. It still didn't kick in, so. <laughs> I guess that means I get to live longer. <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, forget it. <laughs> okay, thank you, TEDx, thank you.